So I'm um, a psychologist, and so I work at National Jewish Health here in Denver, and so I specialize in helping people, usually with insomnia. Um, I do something called CBTI, Cognitive Behavioral Therapy for Insomnia, which is a non-pharmaceutical treatment for insomnia or sleep issues. Um, and so a lot of this talk will focus mostly on insomnia or difficulty falling asleep or staying asleep. Even if someone doesn't have a diagnosis of clinical insomnia, you may have portions or symptoms associated with insomnia where some of these strategies could still be helpful. So I'll primarily focus on that, but of course there's a whole host of other sleep disorders that are relevant and have different treatments as well. And so if anyone has questions about anything else, I can try to help and answer. But um, typically when I, when I talk about sleep, I always go over just some basics because when I get into ways to improve sleep, some of these things are going to be really important to just have like a baseline understanding of how sleep functions. Um, and then I'll tell you a little bit more about what insomnia is. Um, some of you may be very familiar with it already, but um, at the very least, I'll tell you a little bit about, you know, some thoughts on what causes it, how it's treated. And then I really want to spend the bulk of the time talking about ways to improve sleep. Um, so I might rush through some other things, um, get through these slides, and I definitely want to leave time for questions as well. So um, I'm pretty informal, so feel free to let me know if you have any questions or anything comes up. Um, so when we talk about sleep basics, one of the things I like to talk about with patients is just how sleep is structured through the night, um, because it's not as simple as just being awake or being asleep. Um, has anyone ever had a sleep study before? So if you've had a sleep study in a sleep lab, sometimes they do sleep studies at home, um, but in the lab, they hook up electrodes to your head. Um, and so EEGs on your head that measure actual brain activity throughout the night. Um, and so this is what different sleep stages would look like. Um, so when people are awake, there's no real pattern per se. Um, there's many waves per second, but as you start to get drowsy, you, these waves become a little bit more rhythmic and repetitive, a little bit less random. But the first stage of, stages of sleep here really occur at what we call N1. Um, and you can start to see how these look different from these you know, non-sleep stages. But we call this twilight sleep because it, it might not even feel like sleep. So when you're just going to sleep, like in the beginning of the night, you might be sort of half aware of your surroundings. If someone called your name, you would answer. Um, you may have actually slipped into this first stage of sleep without even realizing it. Um, we don't spend a lot of time here in the night. We only spend about 5% of our night here, ideally in this stage one. Um, and it's really just a bridge to deeper, more restorative, more important types of sleep. So it doesn't really serve a huge function other than to get us into the good stuff. Um, the first good stuff, quote unquote, comes here at N2. Um, and this is a more satisfying type of sleep. So we actually spend the greatest percent of our night here. So a lot of times people spend about 40 to 50% of our night here. Most people know they're asleep in N2 or stage two. And I say most people because sometimes there's issues with sleep perception where people feel like they're awake, but they're actually in these sleep stages. And I can answer more questions about that. But most of us are aware that we're asleep when we when we enter this stage two sleep. Um, but really, the biggest benefits come from these next two stages, um, N3 or slow wave sleep, deep sleep. It has a lot of different names. Um, but you can see how different this is from any of the other stages. It's a very deep type of sleep in that it would be difficult to wake someone up from this stage. If you did wake someone up or if someone woke you up, you'd be groggy. Um, you know, it would take you a few seconds to come to to kind of get your bearings. Um, and this type of sleep is thought to be really important for physical health. So restorative for, for our physical body, um, cellular repair, immune health functioning, all of that's taking place in this N3 stage. Um, well, now there's more research saying it might also occur in other stages, but it's most typically associated with this deep sleep. Um, we don't need a whole lot of it. So we only spend about 10 to 20% of our night here um, as adults children spend longer in this stage, um, but we don't need much. Just a little bit gets us enough. Um, but the other type of sleep that you may have heard of is called REM sleep. Has Have people heard of REM sleep before? Can see yes. nods. Okay. 
So REM sleep is a uh, rapid eye movement. And so if you've ever seen someone sleeping and their eyes are closed and it looks like their eyes are moving back really fast, rapidly, this is that REM sleep. And so REM sleep is thought to be really important for brain health. So if deep sleep is important for, you know, physical health, REM sleep is really important for mental and cognitive health. So, um, you know, in REM sleep, it's thought that, you know, uh, memories are formed, learning occurs, emotion regulation happens. Um, typically it's associated with dreaming. They used to think dreaming only happened in REM sleep, um, but now we know that people can dream in other stages as well. Um, but these types of dreams are more like the storybook dreams, like that have a clear plot, you know, very, you know, kind of more detailed. That's typically associated with REM if you don't feel like you dream, don't panic. You know, it doesn't mean you're not getting REM. Um, some people just literally don't remember their dreams upon awakening. So um, typically we spend about ideally 20 to 25% of our night here, but REM is one of the stages that is most commonly disrupted. So it is a lighter sleep in theory, because if you look at this, um, it almost, if I were to zoom into the awake, it looks more similar to awake. Um, you know, our brain is pretty active. And so it's not as deep in that it's not as, it's not challenging to wake someone up from REM sleep. They come to their senses pretty quickly. Um, so that's, that's kind of a, a bad news situation because it can be easily disrupted. And often with insomnia, this is one of the first stages to go is REM sleep. And so that can come with a lot of the symptoms that we associate with insomnia, you know, uh, mood lability or kind of, you know, feeling down or angry or, you know, difficulty managing emotions, forgetfulness, fatigue, low motivation, a lot of that is associated with not getting enough REM sleep. Um, if you wear, I'm going to put a plug here, if you wear any sort of device at night that tracks your sleep, just know that it's not very accurate in staging of sleep. So regardless of what a, any company says, Fitbit, Apple Watch, you know, whatever it is that people may wear, when I see them in clinic, I always let them know that research indicates they're only accurate about 50% of the time. So don't panic if you wear something and it's telling you you're not getting any deep sleep because who knows if it's even accurate. Really the only accurate way we have to stage sleep at this point is with EEGs on, on the head. Um, and so just take that into consideration. Um, you know, don't, don't panic because the more we panic and get anxious about sleep, the worse our sleep gets. Um, the other thing I like to point out is what we call sleep architecture. So this is just basically how sleep is patterned throughout the night. And so this is a typical sleep pattern for a young human adult. So this is like, ideal world, you know, someone in their 20s doesn't have any sleep issues, isn't on any medication that can change sleep stages. Um, but it just gives you an idea of what this would look like. And so um, I find it easiest just to kind of walk you through. So in this, in this little model, so let's say someone is in bed from midnight to eight is their sleep schedule. And so when this person gets in bed at midnight, they might fall asleep, you know, in let's say 10 minutes, 15 Sorry, I think I got muted. Um, it is, can everyone hear me now? Okay, it is not typical to fall immediately to sleep. So I always like to dispel that. Um, you know, you don't, your head shouldn't hit the pillow and you are immediately falling asleep. Sometimes that happens, but usually what that indicates is you're not getting enough sleep. You're sleep deprived. Um, so it should take a few minutes to fall asleep. And so um, ideally not more than 30 minutes, but you know, for this person, let's say about 10 minutes. And then they step down into this stage one sleep, which remember is that kind of bridge to other sleep, twilight sleep, not real restorative. Um, you know, and they're only there for a few minutes, five minutes or so. And then they step down into stage two, which is that more satisfying sleep where people typically, you know, are aware that they're asleep if they were to be woken up. Um, and they spend a little chunk of time there. And within 30 minutes or so, you can see they're already in this delta sleep, which is deep sleep. Um, or that slow wave sleep, which is that physically restorative um, sleep. And so the thing I like to highlight is our bodies move us pretty quickly into this deep sleep because it's the most important or one of the most important for keeping us alive. Um, and so, you know, even if you're missing out on other aspects of sleep, the body is probably going to get you some sort of deep sleep. 
Um, and so, you know, they spent a little bit of time here to get to REM sleep. You actually step back up through the stages. So back up into stage two for a little bit. And then REM is these red bits here. And so you can kind of see this up and down pattern throughout the night. So it's, it's pretty complex how we go through these different stages. Um, if you don't remember anything else about this chart, the one take home that I like to remind people is that almost all of the deep sleep that we're going to get is going to happen in the first half of the night. And again, that's because the body is prioritizing it. So you can see there's little bits of REM, but most of the deep sleep is happening here. Um, and then in the second half of the night, most of the REM sleep is happening. That's where most the bulk of REM sleep occurs. Um, so early morning hours, depending on your sleep schedule, is pretty typical um, for, for REM sleep to be occurring. Sometimes people say they dream a lot in the early morning hours, and that's probably because of this REM sleep. So for this person, you know, from four to eight is when they're getting their REM sleep um, or the most, the bulk of their REM sleep. Um, the other thing I like to highlight is it takes about 90 minutes to cycle through stage two in REM. So 90 minute cycles is something that you can keep in mind as important. Um, you want about four to five cycles a night, ideally, depending on your age. Um, the other thing I, I highlight is that it is normal to wake in the night. So it is considered normal. This is a young adult and they're waking up twice in the night. You can see here, these are awake periods. The biggest thing is, is this wakefulness disruptive to your sleep? So let's say someone wakes up, you know, in 3 a.m., runs to the bathroom, comes back to bed, falls back to sleep in five minutes or so. You can see they kind of briefly spend time in stage one and then get back right into stage two. So they can get back into the good stuff. But if someone spends, you know, an hour, hour and a half awake in the middle of the night, they're almost going to have to start back at the beginning and it's going to cut them off at some point because you're going to wake up for the day. So you can kind of see how that could eat into your REM sleep if you're spending big chunks of time awake in the middle of the night. Um, the other, uh, oh, I guess I don't have this slide yet. I I guess table, usually I talk about how much sleep people need, but I think people need, but I think that comes later. So we'll, we'll get to that. But um, sleep processes is really important when we're talking about how to improve sleep, because these are all things that we can target through our behaviors, through what we do about our sleep. So there's three processes that are thought to be important to sleep, um, and it's basically how sleep functions. The first one is called sleep drive. This one isn't talked about as much. Like I don't, you know, hear a lot about sleep drive as, as I do with some of the other processes, but I like to think about this almost like hunger. It's a process that promotes sleep. So um, in theory, when we wake in the morning, our sleep drive is reset because we've just, we've just slept. But throughout the day, our sleep drive builds. An actual chemical in our body called adenosine builds in the body until nighttime comes. We're able to fall asleep and burn that sleep drive off. So just like hunger, you know, the longer we, we go without food, the more we need it. Same thing with sleep. The longer you go without it, the more you need it. Um, but the key here is that you need a good dose of this to be built up at the right time to be able to not only fall asleep, but stay asleep. It's like having fuel in the tank, so to speak. You need enough to get you through the night. So where people can get into issues, and I'll talk about this more in ways to improve sleep, is let's say someone goes to bed earlier than normal. You know, their sleep drive hasn't built to the same level. And so even if they're able to fall asleep, they may not be able to stay asleep through the night because their, their sleep drive isn't at a point where it's going to last them through the night. Same thing with a big nap in the middle of the day, you know, that's going to burn off a chunk of your sleep drive. And so that might affect your sleep the next night. And of course, all of this changes with chronic health as well, chronic health conditions. So often when I'm working with people here at National Jewish who have all sorts of chronic health conditions, you know, I don't work with a population of people that don't have other issues going on. Um, but these things are still true. So even if you need more sleep because you have a flare up or, you know, whatever is going on, if you take a nap, just know, you know, you might get a little bit less sleep the next night and that's okay. Just plan accordingly. Like maybe you go to bed a little bit later that next night because you had a bigger nap that day, things like that. Um, the other process though, that maintains our sleep is the circadian clock. And I think this one gets more recognition. You know, you may have heard about this with daylight saving time because now of course our circadian clocks are, are interfering with this time change. 
So essentially, circadian clock basically um, controls the timing of our sleep and wakefulness. And so uh, it's, it's a complex process, but to just break it down to the basics, how I think about it is we'd be like cats if we didn't have a circadian clock. You know, our sleep drive would build up throughout the day and would burn it off, you know, in little chunks of time throughout a 24 hour period. But we don't function that way because of this circadian clock. So even as our sleep drive builds, we're able to stay awake throughout the day, um, despite the sleep drive building and building until bedtime comes and we're able to fall asleep and burn off that sleep drive. And so it basically is something that keeps us alert even as the sleep drive builds. In this little chart, it's somewhat confusing, I think, but you can kind of think of it like a wake promoting um, process. So, you know, in the morning, at uh, circadian clock, one of the, the chemicals that regulates it is melatonin. And so when that is basically turned off in our body, our wakefulness increases throughout the day, the longer we go without this melatonin, you know, floating around in our body until nighttime comes, melatonin production increases and our wakefulness goes down and we can burn off that sleep drive. So it's this kind of delicate balance between sleepiness and also the timing of our sleep, because, you know, Sometimes people are born with, you know, you're more of a night owl or you're more of a morning person. And so sometimes when I work with patients, they're really fighting against this internal clock um, and that can be disruptive. Um, but the third process, or well, I guess the one other thing I want to mention about the circadian clock is where it lives. So it lives in this little part of the brain called the hypothalamus, which is connected through the optic nerve to the eyes. So that's just a fancy way of saying that light is what regulates our circadian clock. And so that's why this time change is so disruptive to us, because if you notice now, if you're awake, um, you know, at 6, 630 in the morning, it's not bright anymore. The sun isn't even coming up yet. And that's disruptive to our circadian clock, because getting light around the same time every day is what trains our body to know when to be awake and when to be asleep. And so, you know, you may have heard a lot about um, you know, avoiding certain lights, bright lights, blue lights in the evenings um, to get better sleep. And there is some merit to that. That is important. But sometimes I would ar even argue that light in the morning is more important. And that's often forgotten. So sometimes, you know, people, if you sleep with blackout curtains, things like that, that's fine. But when you wake up in the morning, you want to get a dose of sunlight. About 30 minutes of bright light every morning around the same time is what's going to train your body to know, okay, this is when I should be awake. And alternatively, this is when I should be asleep. Um, you know, we may have certain predispositions, like I said, with this circadian clock, but it's not necessarily pre-programmed in us. It's trained by our environment. Um, that's why, you know, you could move to a totally different time zone and you'd eventually somewhat adjust to their to their time zone because the timing of the light would change. And so that's why light is so important to this sleep-wake process is through this circadian clock. But the third process that I often focus on with people is excessive arousal because you could have a perfect circadian clock and a great amount of sleep drive at the right time every night. But if you have too much mental or physical arousal when you're trying to sleep, it's going to be impossible to sleep. So this could be, you know, anything from difficulty relaxing your body to trouble unwinding and relaxing your mind. Sometimes your thoughts start spinning at night. Um, you start worrying, you start thinking a lot. You know, sometimes people I work with, it is worries, like they're, they're concerned and worried about various things at night. Sometimes it's just their brain won't shut off. But all of this is excessive arousal that's going to disrupt your sleep. And so when it comes to insomnia, you know, really we're thinking about which three of these processes are off in some way. Sometimes it's, it's all the above. Um, sometimes it's really just one or two of these that are the key things that we need to focus in on. But through my treatment with people through the CBTI, we're often trying to make sure that there's a good amount of sleep drive, the circadian clock is well-trained and that our arousal levels are low enough to be able to sleep. So the last little bit I'll put uh, up here, like I mentioned about the sleep basics, is just amount of sleep that we need throughout the lifespan. So as we age, we don't sleep um, as long or as deep, and that's considered normal. Might not be preferable or enjoyable, but it's a normal part of the aging process. 
So does that mean that, you know, when you hit a certain age, you need three hours of sleep at night? Absolutely not. But, you know, our, our needs do decrease as we age. If you look at the um, sleep duration recommendations, you can see, um, you know, there's a steady decline um, from, you know, childhood to young adulthood, and then young adulthood to older age, you can see it goes down even more. And so um, these are recommended amounts, and then amounts that may be appropriate depending on um, basically your sleep needs. Sometimes people need as little as like five or six hours and they feel okay with that. Um, sometimes people need more like nine or 10. So there is a range. So when you hear this, you know, everyone needs eight hours of sleep. That's not the case. It depends on a lot of different factors. Um, the other thing to, to keep in mind is we spend more time awake in the night. We wake up more as we age. So even starting in like our thirties, we start to, to wake at night. Um, and so that's not necessarily considered abnormal. So sometimes it's about just regulating expectations. So when I work with people and they want to hit the pillow, fall asleep, stay asleep for eight hours and wake up feeling great the next morning, you know, if you're, you know, 50, 65, like that might not be the case. However, you should get enough sleep that you feel like you have enough in your battery throughout the day. Um, that being said, you know, again, it, it really matters about how long you're awake in the night. So just because you wake up once or twice doesn't mean you should be spending four hours awake in the middle of the night. So there is a balance that comes with it. Okay, so I'm going to go through this insomnia piece a little bit more quickly so I can get to the good stuff with the recommendations. But you know, as a clinical condition, insomnia is basically dissatisfaction with sleep quantity or quality. There is no sleep test for insomnia. So they don't do a sleep study for insomnia. So that's a common misperception. A lot of times I get people that want to come in and do a sleep study to, to basically figure out their, their insomnia issues. Um, this is all self-report. It's all based on your perception of sleep. You know, do you feel like you have difficulty falling asleep or staying asleep? Um, it's not based on what a test says. And so we do testing for other conditions like sleep apnea, restless leg, periodic limb movement, um, physical conditions, insomnia. It is physical, but um, again, it's self-report. Um, so you have to have issues with quantity or quality, and then you have to be worried about it or have some sort of impact on your life. So sometimes people don't sleep much and they don't miss it. Like they don't feel any of these fatigue or, you know, memory issues or um, mood changes. They're not really concerned about it. They just sleep five hours a night. And that's just how they've always been. That's not a, an insomnia diagnosis. Um, and so it is important about how much you are concerned about it and if it's impairing your life in any way. For a strictly diagnostic perspective, we also have to have a certain frequency and duration of symptoms. So that's really a, a fancy way of saying it doesn't, so everyone has a good and bad night. Everyone has a bad night. That is not, it doesn't mean you have insomnia because you have an occasional bad night of sleep. Um, it's if you're having a lot of bad nights per week and it's, you know, been lasting a while, that's when you might start to think about an insomnia diagnosis. Um, where insomnia is looking at, you know, these, these issues and how they're impacting your life. There is a growing body of research that's focusing more on sleep health in general, less so on this insomnia side of things. And so there's some different categories here. Like you want to have satisfaction with your sleep. You want your sleep to be more or less regular. The timing of your sleep should be, you know, that you're spending, you know, most of the daylight hours awake. Um, sleep continuity, you know, you're not spending big chunks of time awake in the middle of the night, you're getting enough sleep and you're feeling alert. So these things are important, even if you don't have a diagnosis of insomnia. And there are things you can do to improve those factors of sleep health. So when we talk about how to improve it, it's really important to understand too how, how sleep issues can develop because, um, and, and I'm going to quickly go through this. So you can definitely let me know if you have questions, but all of it, a lot of us have what's called predisposing factors. And these are things that make it more likely that you might struggle with sleep at some point in your life. Being born um, biologically female makes your risk higher. Um, certain genetic markers might make your risk higher. Um, but no one's just born with insomnia. Um, it takes some sort of precipitating factor to push you over that threshold, so to speak, to where you're starting to have sleep issues. 
this could be a medical illness. It could be a chronic health condition. It could be, you know, it says psychiatric illness, um, stressful life event, but it doesn't have to be a bad thing. Sometimes I've worked with people where they move and get a new job and it's all great changes, but their sleep gets disrupted. And so it doesn't have to be a bad thing. It's just some sort of change where your body doesn't adapt as you want it to and your sleep starts to get disrupted. Um, but over time, we pretty quickly develop what's known as perpetuating factors. And these are thoughts and behaviors that are meant to help us with the loss of sleep, but actually end up hurting us in the long run. And so that's where this behavioral treatment comes in is this blue box. So over time, as we adapt to whatever stressor caused the sleep issues initially, um, you know, that might go away or we might get used to it. Our genetics don't change, but really what keeps us over that threshold of having sleep issues is thought to be the things that we're doing about our sleep to try to make it better, but it's actually making it worse. Um, you know, I pick on naps a lot, but, um, you know, one of the things I'll talk about is you can still nap. You just want to nap smart, but, um, you know, napping is a big culprit. You know, it's, if you didn't get any sleep the night before and you take a big nap, you're going to feel better the next day, but it's going to keep disrupting your sleep. You're not going to have enough sleep drive the next night. And so you, you can kind of see how it would be a vicious cycle. And so there's a lot of examples of these perpetuating factors and that's good and bad news. Cause the good news is these are things you can change and work on to improve your sleep. Even if you can't change a medical illness or whatever stressor caused the sleep issues initially, you can adjust what you do about it to improve your sleep. Um, and there's been a lot of research on people with varying um, health conditions that still benefit from these types of changes. Um, so a lot of things feed into these uh, three processes being off in some way that can sustain poor sleep or insomnia issues. I've talked about napping already, you know, that lowers the sleep drive and keeps insomnia around. Too much time in bed can actually lower your sleep drive too. So sometimes people give themselves a big window for sleep and all that ends up doing is fragmenting your sleep. And I'll talk more about that, but that can actually lower your sleep drive and disrupt and keep the insomnia around. Variable sleep schedules. So waking up at all different times, um, going to sleep at different times, that's gonna make your circadian clock poorly trained and that's gonna disrupt sleep. And then, some things that can affect arousal levels that are specific to sleep. Um, one is performance anxiety, which is basically, you know, anxiety about your ability to sleep. So pretty quickly, we can start to get in our heads about our sleep. And so we can start to get anxious about our ability to sleep. It's almost like stage fright, but for sleep. And so regardless of how sleepy you are, when you get in bed, if you have that kind of stage fright, it's going to wake you up and it's going to disrupt your sleep. Sometimes conditioned arousal can happen, and I'll talk more specifically about this, but basically this is when you start to associate the bed with being awake instead of being asleep. So you almost train yourself in the opposite direction by accident, um, and you get in bed and you start to feel more awake. So this conditioned arousal often, I can tell it's happening when people tell me like they're falling asleep on the couch or they're so sleepy, and then they get in bed and it's like, bing, the lights go on. That's a condition. Um, and that's something that we can also uncondition. Um, attentional bias. So this is just basically focusing on sleep and trying to sleep, trying really hard to sleep, which causes stress and wakes you up. You know, most people that don't struggle with sleep don't try to sleep. They just do it. It's kind of like breathing. I mean, you all know the importance of breathing and you know that the more you focus on it sometimes, the more off it can feel. Um, and so it can have this almost backfiring effect. The more you focus on sleep, the more you get in your head with it and the more it gets disrupted. Um, and then sometimes this active mind, like our minds just won't shut up for lack of a better term. And that keeps us awake. And so the good news with that is there's, there's ways to treat this. And so CBTI, like I said, is, is one option of many. The other, you know, option is medication. And that's something that you can always talk about with a prescriber, but um, CBTI is basically going to focus on those perpetuating factors, um, and it's a skill building type of treatment. Um, there are ways to do this on your own. I'll talk about an app that you can try if you want to try CBTI, or you can probably find a provider in your area. Um, 
you may have heard of sleep hygiene before. I'm going to move kind of into this ways to improve sleep and, and go through this before I open it up for questions. But um, sleep hygiene is basically good sleep habits that can help you get a better night's sleep. I always want to plug that with sleep hygiene, it is not an indicated treatment for insomnia. So if you have a clinical insomnia diagnosis, you may have gotten some of these recommendations before, like keep your room quiet, dark, have a comfortable mattress, things like that. That's not doing those things is not going to cure your insomnia. And so it can be really frustrating for people. Um, however, if you're just having an occasional bad night, these sleep hygiene techniques might be helpful. And if you do these sleep hygiene techniques, in addition to some of the CVTI, if you have insomnia, that's where you get the most benefit. So, you know, things like not eating or drinking too close to bedtime. If you're waking up to go to the bathroom a lot, um, or if you have GERD acid reflux, you actually want to decrease liquid intake about three hours before sleep, which is a lot longer than some people realize. Um, you know, we have some GI docs here that talk about, you know, two or three ounces should be like a shot glass is all you can have in the three hours before bed um, to like take a pill or something like that. Um, you know, keeping naps short and not too late, exercising regularly. There's been some debate on if exercising or activity before bed is disruptive to sleep. They used to say, don't, don't exercise too close to bedtime. Now they're saying, actually, it's just more important to exercise whenever you can. That's going to help your sleep more. So there's some debate about that. But, um, you know, keeping active in any way that you can, it does not have to be this like, you know, laying on the floor and doing crunches, but like taking a walk, that's, that's probably going to help with your sleep, things like that. Um, you know, you do want your room to be dark and quiet. Make sure it's not too hot or too cold. Um, uh, this one I'll talk about more, but it's a big one. Don't lie awake in bed. Um, the app that I recommend to people, I actually use it here in clinic, is called Insomnia Coach. It's a free app. It's developed by the VA. It's actually a self-help approach to CBTI. So I think in this training plan section, it has like a five or six week training plan. You know, some of it, I don't agree with all they have to say, but I agree with a lot of it. And I think it's good if you want to try some strategies before seeing someone. Um, but often when I talk to people, even friends and family about improving their sleep, I talk about tracking sleep. So even using this app to just every morning when you wake up, chart a few things about your sleep. You just press the plus sign for today and it asks you some questions like, what time did you get in bed? What time did you try to sleep? About how long did it take you to fall asleep? Um, you don't have to watch the clock to figure that out. It's a best guess. You know, did it take you 20 minutes or four hours? You know, big differences. But if you do a few nights of that, ideally even like a week, you start to see some time because sometimes when we're guessing how much sleep we're getting, it gets a little bit um, muddled. You know, we're less accurate with it over time. You know, even if I were to ask you, like, how was your sleep four nights ago? It might be hard to remember that. And so really you need an average amount of sleep that you're getting to know what your sleep window should be. And so you get that by tracking your sleep. And so the most important thing is to set an earliest bedtime and a latest wake time and follow it every day, regardless of how much sleep you get. So it's not a fun thing to do, um, but it really whips your sleep into shape. And so if you're averaging, let's say, you know, across a week, you're averaging six hours, about six and a half to seven hours should be all you're scheduling for sleep. So, you know, think about what a difference that would look like for someone who's giving themselves a big sleep window. Um, but kind of like I mentioned, that big window actually backfires. It fragments your sleep more. You spend time awake in the beginning of the night or the middle of the night. You want to try to trim out the fat and basically set your sleep window for more realistically what you're sleeping. And then you can always add in more time as you start to get more sleep. Hopefully that's making sense and I can explain it more if you have questions, but um, you want to let sleepiness guide your bedtime. So that's why it's earliest bedtime. If you've had a stressful day and that earliest bedtime comes and you feel wired, it's better to stay up another 30 minutes or an hour and like, you know, wind down a bit more, get a bit more sleepy because you don't want to get in bed feeling like that and just lay in bed awake. That's the worst thing that you can do for your sleep. 
Um, but you don't want to compensate for missed sleep. So you kind of just write off a bad night. Like if you get in bed an hour later, you know, you still wake up at the same time. You might be more tired that day, but that tiredness, that sleep drive is going to help you the next night. Um, so you kind of write off a bad night that it's going to help you in the coming night. Um, the other part though, is making sure you're not spending too much time in bed awake. So the sleep schedule and too much time in bed awake are two of the biggest things that I work on with people. Um, because spending a lot of time in bed awake, it conditions you to be awake in the bed. Um, it makes it harder to sleep. And this is all because of classical conditioning. Like if you've ever heard of Pavlov's dog, you know, that, that old experiment, you know, in the, I think 1800s, basically we can train ourselves to do all sorts of things that we didn't mean to train ourselves to do. And one of those is being awake in the bed. So, um, click through here. So if you're, you know, stressed out, awake, worried, what, for whatever reason, you're going to feel awake. It's hard to feel tired and sleepy when you're, you know, have some sort of hyper arousal going on. If you pair that with the bed, you're going to be awake, but pretty quickly, you don't even have to have this negative emotional state to, to get in the bed and feel awake. And so that's what I mean when I say conditioned response, you know, at this point, now you get in bed and you're awake. And so the way to untrain that is if you are awake for longer than 15 to 20 minutes, getting out of the bed. Um, it might not help you that night to get any more sleep, especially when you're going to wake up at the same time the next morning, but it's going to retrain you and it's going to help you in the long run. I always tell people CBTI is like a long, long game situation. It's, it might not help you that night, but it's going to help you retrain yourself. Um, so if you're in bed, you don't need to watch the clock to know, oh, it's been 20 minutes. I got to get up because that's going to increase your stress. You're going to be on like a, a deadline to get to sleep, which is going to backfire. Um, it's really just if you know you've been wide awake for a while, not dozing, not in and out of sleep, you know, like fully awake and you're starting to feel anxious, annoyed, uncomfortable, stressed, um, angry, any of those negative things, that's when you want to get out of bed. Um, you go do something, you know, I always say do something engaging, but not overly stimulating. That's where I differ with the app. The app tells you to like read a phone book, like something so boring that it's going to, you know, basically motivate you to go back to bed. What I find is for some people that can just increase the stress because as you're doing something boring and if you're not feeling sleepy, you start to get angry and annoyed and that wakes you up more. So just kill a little bit of time, listen to something, read something, keep it low key, can be five, 10 minutes. And if you feel sleepy again, get back in the bed, but you're just breaking up that process. So you're not laying there for hours awake in the bed. Um, consistency is what is most important about this. So if you only do this, sometimes it's not going to untrain you. Um, and then if you do this and you then like sleep in the next day, that's not going to help either. So you have to be pretty strict about it, but usually you don't have to be strict for long. Like if the more strict you are early on, the faster these issues start to resolve and then you can start to get more sleep. Um, I kind of say it's just like a diet, like, you know, the more strict you are with it, you know, the better, and then you can ease up on it. So this isn't a forever thing. Like you can never sleep in again. It's just when you're trying to wrangle your sleep and get it under control, you have to be strict with it. Um, and then I'll just quickly talk about one or two of these strategies and then I'll open it for questions. So this active mind at night is another thing that we focus on in CBTI. Um, one of the things that I recommend is what's called a buffer zone. So you don't wanna just go, go, go all day and then get in bed and try to sleep. You wanna have at least 30, 45 minutes of a transition period every night to train yourself that bedtime is coming. And so even if you're just you know like watching TV, have something in between the watching TV in the evenings and getting in bed. Like you have to have some sort of little transition period in there. Um, it's also a good rule of thumb to, to cut down on things that stress you out in this time. So sometimes I have people that set big goals for themselves. Like they're not going to look at their phone at all for four hours before bed. And then it's like really hard to follow that guideline. So maybe give yourself a little bit more wiggle room. Like you can look at your phone in the evenings, but starting 30 minutes before your bedtime is when you put the phone down and you're not looking at social media. You're not playing games that activate your mind. You're not watching the news. That's a big one. Like no news in the 30 minutes before bed. Um, 
Another thing you can try is something called constructive worry. And so this is if you worry a lot in bed at night, what you can do is essentially try to get ahead of it by setting a time every day where you're going to sit down and worry. And some people are like, Dr. Smith, why the heck would I do that? I don't want to worry. And the idea is that you're going to worry anyway. Might as well train yourself to do it at a time where it's not disruptive to your sleep. And so we call it constructive too, because it's almost like a problem solving time. Like you can write out your worries, but also think about next steps. Um, Even if something doesn't have a very easy next step, um, the idea is, you know, spending some time thinking about it and what can you do to even adjust to the situation? Like, you know, a chronic health issue. It's not like there's an easy final solution for that, but what do you need to do to adapt to live your life despite you know, your health status, things like that. It's just some time to think about some of these things and then almost metaphorically closing the box on it and telling yourself if those thoughts pop up the next night that you've already thought about it today, you're going to think about it again tomorrow. You don't need to think about it right now. So it's basically postponing the worry. And so I think I'm going to leave it there because I know we have about 10 minutes um, and I think I got through most of the important stuff, but hopefully I gave you some good little pointers, tips and tricks in there. Um, definitely check out the app if you want more. Um, and I always like to just remind people a bad night of sleep every now and then is normal. It's also normal to feel tired and fatigued depending on what's going on in your life. So it might not just be your sleep. Think about all the other reasons there are to feel tired and fatigued, you know, because people that sleep great, they still struggle with tiredness sometimes. And so, you know, your stress levels, your health, things like that can also impact how you feel during the day that has nothing to do on your, with your sleep. So keep that in mind too. Um, but if the, the bad nights really outweigh the good nights, then, you know, there are things to do. There are some strategies to try. So. Yeah, I guess any questions? Thank you so incredibly much. I took a lot of notes, um, but I'm going to, Kira, anything in the Q&A? I'm well, glad you brought that up because I didn't, I forgot to mention the nap piece that I wanted to, to plug. So um, really the biggest thing is they say about 30 minutes. Yep. So 30 minutes is good, but really you can probably get away with less than like an hour or less. And keep in mind, that's from like head down to head up. So that's because you might be getting into some light stages, even if you don't realize it. So sometimes people keep delaying the alarm because they feel like they're not asleep yet. But then you end up spending like two hours trying to nap and that's too much. So really like that hour or less. Um, And then the other important part is you want it to be seven to nine hours after you wake up. Um, that's thought to be less disruptive to your circadian clock because the issue with going back to bed in the morning, for instance, is your body doesn't distinguish that as a separate sleep period. And so it gets your clock confused. So, you know, if you wake up at seven, like somewhere between two and four is a good time for a nap. Um, Keep in mind too, if your sleep isn't disrupted at night and you just need more sleep, but like, let's say you're sick or, you know, you're dealing with something, you can like, if you can take a two hour nap and then sleep a full night, like that's fine. Really, this is just something you have to change if it's disrupting your sleep at night. Is it better to stay awake during a day, the day if we have trouble sleeping at night or is it better just to get that nap? Yeah, so I think I always say like nap smart. So like if if you can tell yourself like, I'm gonna wake up at this, wake time, no matter how I slept the night before, but I'll give myself, you know, 30 minutes to an hour to lay down, you know, seven to nine hours after I wake up. So in the afternoon or something like that, that can be a good motivator to keep your wake time. And then it can also help you make it until your bedtime. Because if you slept really poorly one night, let's say, and you, it might be hard to stay awake until your bedtime. And then that ends up disrupting your whole schedule. So I I would say, yes, it's better to take that short nap and help you make it until your bedtime. Hey, my other question is for those of us who take a lot of diuretics, we Mm. get up like every two, three hours at night and then we can't get back to sleep. Do you have any suggestions for that? Yeah, so I talk to you, I always recommend 
sometimes the medication piece is like you're fighting an uphill battle, right? Like diuretics, uh, prednisone or steroids, like all of that, like there are just things that are going to disrupt your sleep. And, you know, diuretics can definitely be one. Um, depending on what you're taking, I would talk to whoever's prescribing it or your pharmacist and see about the schedule of when you're taking it. Like, you know, can you take it earlier in your day so that it's not, you know, sometimes it's just like a timing thing. So you're not taking it right before bed. Sometimes you have to, you know, like that's just how it's prescribed. Um, and if that's the case, I think the biggest the best thing you can do is to know that when you wake up, if you're not asleep again in that like 20 ish minutes, you don't want to just lay in bed indefinitely. Um, so keeping in mind, like that recommendation of leaving the bed, if you're not sleeping in an ideal world, if you have to wake up and go to the bathroom, you can come right back to bed and go right back to sleep. But um, if that's not happening, um, you don't want to just lay there and try to force it. I so, can so say so um, money store here. Uh -huh. Um, in, in my experience, uh, my girlfriend talked me into putting my, my meds on a, an alarm and I'm like, no, <laughs> cause I don't, I just take them, you know, when I think about it, but I started doing that. Um, and so I take my meds in the morning when I wake up at around eight 30 and then I take, I have an alarm that goes off at one 30 and I take sleep medication. So I set that for seven 30. So that way I have a half an hour before going to bed for those to kind of kick in and taking my diuretics in the afternoon around 30, I find that I get up less in the middle of the night um, because it's giving, because usually the diuretics, at least the ones I'm on, have like the six hour window where they're most effective. And so if you take it at least six hours before you go to bed, you'll have a better, um, you'll have better luck of being able to sleep through the night, only getting up once or twice rather than the four or five times we tend to end up getting up. You know what, you brought something up, sleep medication. Some people take sleeping pills because, well, they gotta go to sleep. And is that current? To getting on a schedule to having good night's sleep because I've talked to people who have sleep medication, but then they still get up in the middle of the night. So mm. is that a deterrent? Uh, you mean a deterrent to the medication? No, like, like um, you were talking about having a sleep pattern. Yeah. If you're, if you're to me, I don't know. It is taking sleeping pills helpful when you're trying to get on a schedule, so to speak? Yeah, I think it's definitely case by case. And you'll find when you talk to providers that can prescribe, people have hugely different opinions on sleep medications. Some people don't want to prescribe it at all. Some people are like, let me give you a whole pharmacy. So like people have varying opinions on it. The longer I work in the sleep world, the more I realize like people, there is a use, there is a reason we have sleep medications. Some people are going to need sleep medications. Um, the it doesn't doesn't mean that you can't do some of these strategies. In fact, I'd say a good 50% of the people I work with also take a sleep medication. It doesn't have to be either or because sometimes the sleep medicine doesn't fully solve the problem. It makes it better. And then if you add in some of these behavioral strategies on top of that, that's where you can see the best bang for your buck, so to speak. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Um, so that's a tricky thing to do. And it's something that takes some time, right? Like you're untraining yourself in how you think about your sleep. And so um, one of the, the best things I think people can do is to shorten their sleep window, which sounds really counterintuitive. But like, if you stay up later, you are going to be more sleepy, and you're going to have less room for those worries, because you're going to be pretty tired. So like, I'm not saying stay up all night, but, you know, don't go to bed and give yourself, you know, this big opportunity to lay in bed and, and just think about your sleep. That's, that's, I think, suggestion number one I would have. Um, the other suggestion I would have, I probably don't, can't get into all of it, but in the app, there's a really good list of what's called common sleep beliefs. And it talks about some of these perceptions and ways that we think about our sleep that can actually disrupt our sleep. 
And so you might find that really informative. And so I'd recommend reading through some of those, but sometimes it's just about changing how you think about your sleep and realizing that you can, if you've had insomnia for years, I would bet you anything that you can function on very little sleep. And so like reminding yourself of you can function after a bad night of sleep, like you will get through the day and the next night will come and you'll manage. So like almost having this expectation of like taking some of the fear out of it can also help decrease the pressure because the more you start to think like, oh my gosh, if I don't sleep tonight, I'm not going to function. These test results aren't going to be accurate. You know, everything's going to fall apart. Well, now that it's this high pressure situation where sleep is going to be impossible. So just reminding yourself that you can manage, you can get through, even if it's not an ideal situation. Yeah, exactly. (laughs) Yeah. And I found that the, the tracking can be good, but for people that tend to focus a whole lot on their sleep, I would say, you know, track a little bit and then maybe do away with the tracking. Cause sometimes the tracking can actually, you get to in your head about your sleep. So like get an understanding of your patterns and then don't track again. No, no, I wish it was, but the, the bad thing about alcohol is that it's going to disrupt the quality of your sleep. So if anyone has ever accidentally had a little bit too much to drink, you know that you could sleep hours and hours and feel exhausted the next day. And that's because it's disrupting the stages of your sleep. So having that, you know, even just one drink before bed, it might put you to sleep, but the quality of your sleep is going to be pretty poor. It changes the staging of your sleep. Mm -hmm. Um, And then pretty quickly that one drink does nothing. And so then you need two drinks and now you're in a slippery slope. Um, So I'd say, you know, is if you drink alcohol, you know, I'm not here to say no one can drink alcohol, but I wouldn't do it right before bed. Yeah. So the thing with sleepy time tea or chamomile that I I can, so it can backfire in that then you have to wake up to go to the bathroom. (laughs) So like the problem with drinking something right before bed is it can then actually, you know, it, it helps you wind down and calms you down and then you get in bed and you fall asleep, but then you have to wake up to go to the bathroom. So sometimes it's not the actual, actually research says like, it's not the actual substances in the tea that is promoting sleepiness it's almost the ritual of it you know this like relaxing time that you're sitting down you're having a hot beverage you're what it's that wind down that's so important so if you can almost recreate that without liquids it's going to be better um if you love a cup of tea before bed I'd say just make it a small one um you know the smaller the better okay so my my question I guess is when I'm going to go back to napping if yeah. you have a person, basically, I think what you what you said was that if a person naps for like maybe two hours a day, because I've known people who do it because they don't sleep at night. So it might not affect their sleep that night, but it might affect your sleep the next night. Did I hear that right? Or Oh, so um, I don't know what exactly I said, but I probably said something along the lines of it might not just, dis- you know, depending on the person, some people can nap and it doesn't disrupt their sleep. And so like, you don't have to change something if it's not broken. So like, if you're someone who can nap and then sleep and it's not an issue, that's fine. Um, It's just, if you find that, you know, you're not sleeping one night and you're not sleeping well, so then you nap and then you don't sleep that next night. And so then you nap. And so it's like this, then this vicious cycle, and that's what you have to break. That's when you want to start looking at, okay, maybe I just need to fight through the day and push it until my bedtime so I can get more sleep that night. However, I also have worked with people, they take pain pills or various medications that make them very sleepy during the day, and they have to take a nap. And so if that's the case, I'd say like, okay, if you're going to take a two hour nap and you're sleeping about five hours at night start to to just change how you're structuring your sleep, like build in that two hour nap, ideally seven to nine hours after you wake up and then lower your expectations for your nighttime sleep. You know, if, if, if you're someone that takes a two hour nap and you can't sleep eight hours that next night, don't even try for that. You know, you're going to average seven total. So you do five hours at night and two hours during the day or something mm-hmm. like that. You might just have to change your expectations. 
Mm -hmm. Did I answer your question in a roundabout way? No, actually you did because, um, you know, I, I was wondering, you know, sometimes we take naps or we just drop off, to, at least I do. I just drop off to sleep and it wasn't planned, trust me. And I'm wondering, you know, does that, should that be included in part of the time that you spend in the bed at night? I mean, like if I take a two hour nap, and let's just say I take, I, I go to sleep for five hours. So do I say that I had seven hours worth of sleep? Yep. Yep. Oh. So yep. somebody maybe who takes a three hour nap and only gets about three hours worth of sleep in the bed, let's just say, they basically had six hours of sleep. Yep. We always look at sleep per 24 hour period. Um, keep in mind though, you don't want to get into a pattern where you're sleeping, you know, just like an hour, six times a day or something like that. Cause you're not going to get the quality of sleep that you want, but like there is some arguments and research that supports, can you break sleep up into two sleep periods? Possibly. Yes. Um, but where you get into trouble is if you're trying to get, you know, a full, like the full amount of sleep at night, but not accounting for the sleep that you're getting during the day. That makes sense because, you know, lots of times you say, oh, they only got three hours worth of sleep at night, but then you had a three hour nap. So technically right. you got six hours of sleep. Yep, exactly. Mm -hmm. I'd say too, if people struggle, you know, there's all sorts of reasons for dozing during the day um, that doesn't, again, doesn't have to do with sleep. But if you are having trouble staying awake throughout the day, um, I would recommend a sleep study, like talking to a doctor because like, you might have something going on physically too with your sleep that like sleep apnea or something like that, um, where that could help you get better sleep too. Thank you so much, Dr. Smith. Um, welcome. We, we yeah. do know that sleep, sleep, good sleep, quality sleep, like you say, is attached to quality health. And, and I don't think that we, for one thing, no offense meant to doctors, but I don't think that most doctors stress that enough, the sleep thing. I mean, yeah, not too many people ask me, but not too many of my medical staff say how 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 about how I'm sleeping. So mm. this was really great. I took like a page full of notes, and Go also <laughs> oh, that was to, to let everybody know, if you logged on later, you can go to our website, Team Phenomena Hope, and you can see this in a few days. Give us a few days. Well, not us, because you know I'm not doing it. But give a team phenomenal hope people a few days, and you can find it this whole session on our website. So if you miss some of it, you can find it on the website. Also, just want to tell you that we're going to have a special session next month in April. So be looking forward on the website uh, on mental health, sleep, and mental health. To me, kind of go hand in hand together. So we're going to have a special session on that. And I invite you all back. And I just want to thank you, Dr. Smith, for all for this was phenomenal. It really was yeah. because I took notes. So now I know, you know, when I get up in the middle of the night, I'll watch continue watching Scooby Doo, which is what I do to put me back to sleep. Everybody got some. And just not in bed. Yeah. What? <laughs> not bed. Get out of bed. <laughs> get out of the bed. Yeah. Get out of the bed when oh, you're yeah. awake. <laughs> yep. You all have my email. Let me know if you have any questions. Thank you all for coming on. I, I'm, I'm devastated about the Scooby Doo thing, but <laughs> sorry, I ended with bad news. Because <laughs> I talk to Shaggy and everybody when I'm half asleep. Okay. Oh gosh. Okay. <laughs> so hope to see you all next month for uh, our mental health uh, session. And thank you so much, Dr. Smith. Really appreciate it. Uh -huh. Thank you all Take for coming care, on. Everyone. Have a Thank great you. holiday. Be blessed. Take care.